Hello and welcome. Thanks everyone for joining. It's fantastic to have you here for the Newsroom Apprenticeship at the Financial Times and Manchester Evening News Learn More session. I'd love to hear where you're tuning in from today. So please do pop that in the chat, say hello, your name and where you're tuning in from in the UK. I'm hoping to have um, some candidates potentially based in Manchester, um, but likely also all around the UK. So we'd love to hear from you. Please do pop in the chat where you're tuning in from. And we'll make a start shortly. Lovely. Got someone who's joining from London, but studied, lived in Manchester for three years. Fantastic. Hitting all, ticking all the boxes there. <laughs> Fantastic. And yeah, if everyone else could continue to um, let us know where you're tuning in from, we'd love to hear from you um, and um, we'll progress on. So I'm going to talk a little bit about creative access to start with. We are a social enterprise working to make the creative industries reflect society. I've been going 12 years. This is our a photo from our 10 year anniversary party a couple of years ago with some of our wonderful alumni. And we provide career long access, opportunities, support and training to individuals from underrepresented groups. And we work with the leading creative employers throughout the UK to connect with opportunities and help you to unlock your potential. So that's a little bit about us. I'm Laura and um, I work at Creative Access as the Director of Access and support the teams overseeing our recruitment, our opportunities board and our outreach. Um, and in today's session, and um, we'll be learning more about the Financial Times and what it's like working at one of the world's leading news organisations, along with Manchester Evening News, Britain's biggest regional news brand. So super exciting. Um, we'll be covering what the Newsroom Apprenticeship Programme involves and how it's structured and um, with all the detail covered. So you've got all that information to put in the best application you can. Um, we're also joined by a current apprenticeship who will be telling you more about their journey. Um, as well as lots of top tips, advice and guidance all throughout the session. So I hope you've got pen and paper to hand to take some notes. I'm also just going to have a little peruse who's joining us. Thanks, Kay from London. Got Fiona tuning in from Yorkshire. Um, Adele also. We've got a couple of colleagues joining us from the FT and Manchester Evening News also in the audience. So they're going to be on hand if we have any questions later too. And now um, I'm going to introduce our amazing panel, super, super delighted to have with us this evening, Sarah Lester, who's the editor at Manchester Evening News, um, Veronica Khan Dapar, um, assistant editor at Financial Times, as well as Macy Grice, apprentice journalist at the Financial Times. So I'm going to hand over first to Sarah, just to talk a little bit about her career pathway to date and her current role, and then um, to hand over to Veronica, followed by Macy, please. Hello, um, really lovely to be here. Um, it's a scheme we're really, really keen on, and very happy to be involved in. So my career started as a patch reporter, um, actually initially on a weekly paper and then on uh, the Manchester Evening News covering a patch. It's a kind of traditional pathway, came from university and did a, a postgrad. Um, I then went to do investigations at the MEN and ended up running the investigations team and we locked up some uh, bad people, which was good. Um, and then I went into quite early in my late 20s, I went into newsroom management uh, onto the news desk, various different roles on the news desk before, before coming um, news editor and then eventually assistant editor, head of news um, I then um, led the newsroom in its digital transition. So it was kind of like 15 years ago when we realised print was only going in one direction. We uh, turned the newsroom so that all the content is created for the website and the app and other digital platforms. Now we have TikTok and other social media. So our thinking was very much being where the audience is and it stopped being with papers as much. Um, we still have a paper, but it, our main focus is digital. We build a paper out of that. Um, and so I led the transition to that and then ultimately uh, became editor, which is kind of, as a Mancunian, is a, a huge dream of mine. I didn't I didn't actually ever think I'd get to this role, um, but it, it shows you um, I, I wasn't someone with a, I think I'm going to make it here. So that's kind of a brief intro. I don't know whether you need any more, if that's OK. That's perfect. Thanks so much, Sarah. I'm now going to hand over to Veronica.
Hey, sorry about that. Um, so I'm Veronica Kandapar, one of the assistant editors here at the Financial Times. Um, I have a couple of roles. I oversee video and audio reporting, and I also oversee newsroom diversity. So part of my role is to try to sort of lead, help help lead our newsroom towards a sort of future where it's more representative of the community and communities that we serve. And so the apprenticeship is a very big part of that. Um, we were we have a number of initiatives running in the newsroom, um, but one of the things we're very cognizant of is that um, our the the main um, pathway to joining the Financial Times is through the graduate trainee scheme. That's the sort of most open way to come into the Financial Times. And that's, of course, restricted to people that have been to university and hold a degree. And we were aware that that meant that that placed quite a narrow restriction on the type of people that we were likely to get coming through as early careers journalists or new starting journalists. Um, and so we designed the apprenticeship to create another door, if you will, into the Financial Times um, at that early career level. And so because of that, um, we do not accept applications for this apprenticeship. If you have a degree, if you're studying for a degree, if you've ever studied for a degree, um, because this really is aimed at people that aren't going to university. Um, what we will what we will do is support the winning candidate through a course with the um, NCTJ, which is industry recognized um, accreditor of the journalism qualification. Um, we're looking at a level five qualification here. Um, and that involves around seven months, I want to say, study. Um, and obviously it's then followed by some time with the Manchester Evening News. In fact, there's some overlap with the study in your time at Manchester Evening News before coming back to London, where you would be working with our colleagues at Investors Chronicle, which is a publication that looks specifically at investment and issue stories around the investing world. And after three months at the Investors Chronicle, you would be coming to the Financial Times. Um, to join us in our newsroom. Um, we have news desks that cover everything from global affairs um, and what we call the World Desk. Um, we have desks that look specifically at company news, desks that are more focused on data and data journalism, understanding the world through data that also contribute to our news output. Um, and then, of course, we have desks such as the opinion um, desk where where we all find on our pages sort of the comment and opinion from our own columnists and also from contributors that we bring in. So taken as a whole, um, I think the opportunity gives somebody a really varied experience. Um, as I say, some of it's classroom based, but much of it is learning on the job, um, both at the Manchester Evening News and here at the Financial Times and with our colleagues at Investors Chronicle, which is a sister paper to the Financial Times. Great, thanks so much, Veronica, and providing some additional detail. And we'll kind of recap on um, some of the kind of um, key aspects of the apprenticeship in the coming slides as well. And um, I just want to give Macy the opportunity to introduce herself for a couple of minutes as well, and then we'll get into more of the detail. Thank you. Hi everyone, I'm Maisie. It's great to be speaking to you all about the apprenticeship. It's a uh... Obviously, as being a parent, I'm very passionate about it as well. Uh, I'm from Manchester, where the scheme is primarily wanting applicants to come from. Uh, primarily, my family are based in Salford. My mum is a nurse. My brother is a soldier. In my family, this kind of world, creative industry, isn't one that is generally pushed onto me. In my world, it was trades, women were hairdressers. We stayed within our circle. So this apprenticeship kind of gave me the leap into what I wanted to do. Prior to this, I was working at Salford Royal, which is one of the Northwest biggest hospital as admin staff, which was not what I wanted to do. I was very grateful for the job. It's given me a very, very good understanding of Manchester, which is very beneficial for this role. 
But with that as apprenticeship, I would not have been able to step into this world because as Veronica was saying, my route into this industry is not traditional. So yeah, very grateful for this apprenticeship and very happy to be talking about it with you all. Great, thanks so much everyone. Um, so now we're gonna kind of move on to more of the specifics um, and I've included here a QR code that links directly through to the opportunity um, that you can apply for via Creative Access. Um, and I'm gonna hand over to Ronica to talk more about the scheme now in its second year. Yeah, so as I said, this is a scheme aimed at broadening the intake at um, very early career level. So um, we're expecting applicants to not have worked um, as a professional journalist um, before they apply. We're also expecting, well, we also require that applicants aren't um, holders of a degree or haven't studied, as I said, for a degree or aren't applying um, concurrently for degree places as well as an apprenticeship place you know we're really looking here to find a candidate that brings different sort of life experiences which is why we were so pleased with Maisie and why she felt fit the bill so well for us sorry <coughs> um so um there is a study element as I said to this and it's um uh studying for a NCTJ qualification with um with PA here in London so for the first part of the apprenticeship I think the first three to four months the candidate will be in London in London studying um with one day at the Financial Times usually a Friday so that's the time in industry that's required by the course um then after about four months candidate moves to or the successful candidate moves to um the Manchester evening news and works with um, Sarah's newsroom and then they'll have an opportunity to learn local reporting which has has quite specific skill requirements um, that we feel aren't often taught as well in um, academic um, environments so um, we think that learning um, as an apprentice with an actual local news provider um, will bring us skills that can't be acquired as well or as thoroughly um, in the environment of the classroom. Um, so a lot of people, especially that do our graduate trainee programs, will have a second degree or a lot of the applicants have a second degree um, in journalism. One of the things that we found that that meant that they were lacking was the on the ground reporting experience that really local news providers are the absolute best uh, providing. So it has some classroom training and then some very intensive on the ground reporting training at the Manchester Evening News before returning to London um, to work with our colleagues at Investors Chronicle. And there you're an introduction to the world of business and investing, I guess. It's a um, journal, so it's not a daily publication. It's um, a little slower than in terms of output, but um, it gives you the opportunity to be much more thorough getting to know the content. Um, and you'll be there for three three months, um, by the end of which, um, I think you'll probably know a lot more about investing and business than you might believe you'll be able to at the outset. We really don't want people to feel that because they don't have any um, experience with um, financial news that that would discount them from um, applying. That's absolutely not the case. We don't expect people to come with that knowledge. What we do expect is for people to come with an open mind, a willingness to learn, a sense of curiosity, um, somebody that already has questions about how the world works, how the world's connected um, and what finances um, much of what we see around us so you know where's the money coming from where is it going to and what does it go through in the process so you know if you have those type of questions or if those if the thought of those questions sort of piques your interest 
then absolutely this is something you should be applying for. Please don't be concerned that you haven't been immersed in the world of business and finance up until this point. Um, so after your time with our colleagues in Investors Chronicle, you'd be moving over to the Financial Times newsroom, um, where, as I said, there are a variety of desks that look at the world and finance and business from different perspectives and would expect you to move through some of them. Probably the most well-known desks would be the company's desk, which I guess we're pretty famous for, the market's desk, but also we have um, desks like the world desk that look at global affairs and developments. Um, we also have the opinion desk, as I said, that is um, quite a key part of the Financial Times and where you will hear sort of ideas and opinions expressed by um, experts, both internal to the FT, so our own columnists, but also external from the FT. So often some quite big names featuring there. Um, and then there's UK desk as well. So there is a chance to look at home, home news as well. Um, not so local, not so um, connected with the communities that we're covering in the way that you would in Sarah's newsroom. But that's really why we appreciate the um, the apprentice having experience of the Manchester Evening News as well as the Financial Times, because those skills that you learn covering communities very deeply and very closely, we feel are incredibly useful, even when you're covering, you know, the world from, you know, one or two steps back, they're, they're skills that we are very keen to have present in our newsroom. Incredible. Thanks for the overview, Veronica. And it just sounds like such an amazing opportunity with so many different areas to cover um, and for that successful candidate to, to learn from. Um, I'd love to hear more about kind of, you know, what really does someone need to, in order to succeed? So being curious, open minded, a truth seeker. Could you tell us more about kind of what you're looking for? Yeah, you know, I think that we're looking for people that, as I said, have questions about the world, that look at the world and think why things that way are not a different way or look at the world and think, you know, what what enables uh, a, a, per, a person, an individual or a company or a government to behave the way in which they do? What are the structures that allow them to behave in these ways or to have particular outcomes or to, um, I guess, channel the way the world works. I think if, if you think about these questions, even if you don't have the answers, even if you don't feel that you are easily able to access the information around you that might give you these answers, if they're questions that occur to you, then I think that you could be a journalist in the making, you could be an FT journalist in the making. Um, being open-minded, I think you need to be able to be interested in a variety of things, not just the things that impact you most directly. I think that most things, I, I feel as a journalist, most things are interesting um, as long as you sort of are interested in them. So the more you look at things, the closer you examine things, always the more you find, the more you discover, the more questions occur to you. So I think that if you're willing to turn your mind and attention to matters that you might not have thought were the most interesting before or the most sort of rich subject areas or things that um, sort of pertain to your life and the people around you. If you're willing to engage with the world on that basis, then again, I think you could be a Financial Times journalist in the making. Um, this is a really intensive programme. Um, there is a classroom element and Maisie will tell you um, better than me. It's very demanding um, and we do expect people to be um, achieving the highest possible sort of outcomes for themselves. So that's very intensive. Um, but then also moving through the Manchester Evening News, Investors Chronicle, the Financial Times, you know, three months might sound like a long time, but actually it's a very compressed 
um, experience that you're getting. So there's a lot to take in over the sort of 18 month time period. Um, so we are looking for people that are able to take in information quickly, people that are committed to retaining information that's shared with them, you know, and that doesn't mean to say that you have to be sort of the brain of Britain and be able to sort of have a photographic memory and remember absolutely everything that you've been told. Um, but it does mean having a commitment to trying to take note of what you're being taught to keep um, files that you're able to refer back to, notes that you're able to refer back to, so that you can use your time most efficiently. So that we're not having to sort of go over and repeat information because like I say, it's a really compressed amount of time in um, each sort of arena. And we want everybody to get as much, we want people to get as much as they can out of each separate experience. Um, Determined, I think that determination plays into that. Um, you know, in order to um stay stay open to the amount of information that's going to be thrown at you and to be retaining what you need to retain, um, you're gonna to have to be determined. You know, you're gonna to have to have made um a commitment to yourself to not only do your best but to see it through. So I think that, you know. That's something that people might want to sit and think about um, before they um, put through their applications. Is this, is this an amount of time that I'm willing to dedicate um, to what's a lot of work, learning and a lot of hard work? Um, you know, and for some, it might not be for everybody, um, but I think that there are a fair amount of people out there that would enjoy the experience and relish the pace. So, and I guess they're the people that we're looking for excellent communicator, um, written and spoken English. Um, we don't expect you to turn up um, ready to write the front page article um, with no errors on day one, but um, I guess we are looking for somebody that um, enjoys using the English language, that enjoys um, writing, that enjoys reading. Um, and I think the rest we feel can be taught um, in the classroom um, with Sarah and her team and here at the FT. Um, and I guess, yeah, lastly, we, we need somebody that's able to be quite adaptable because you are going to find yourself in many different scenarios, not just between Manchester and London, but also just day to day. Journalism is not a job where you sort of clock in at nine and have a clear schedule for how your day is going to pan out and then clock it clock out as expected at sort of 5 30 um in any given day there's a lot of chopping and changing and reassigning and so you know journalism you know is best suited to somebody that again relishes that kind of challenge and feels that um that 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 kind of workflow would bring out the best in them Brilliant. And I appreciate the details. I think that will really help everyone here um, put in the best possible application. So thank you. I'm going to talk now a little bit more about the process of applying through Creative Access. So you um, have obviously seen our advert and signed up for this webinar. Um, but the, the small print at the bottom outlines the process of um, applying via Creative Access. So please do upload your CV, cover letter and applications questions as one document via the apply button and once submitted you can't um you can no longer amend your application so do proofread that really essential especially in this profession um before you before you send hit the send and um submit button um, and i'm going to just talk quickly about the different um, things to include in each of those areas so in your cv please tell us the date you took your gcses and a levels or equivalent your exam grades, your work experience to date, um, and any language data or social media skills. In your cover letter, please tell us why you think you'd make a great reporter. What are your interests? What are your passions? And why should we pick you? Tell us about a journalist you admire from any publication and why. And then finally, um, if you could please answer the following applications questions. So one, tell us why you want to be a journalist, 300 words max. Please stick to that. 
And then also tell us about yourself and your potential to benefit from this opportunity. Um, again, 300 words maximum. Um, just practically on this, please do provide both the CV and the cover letter. Both of those together are essential for this application. So now I'm gonna hand over to Sarah to talk more about the partnership with Manchester Evening News and what you will gain from that um, exposure. Hello everyone, uh, feel free to pop up with any questions because I'll keep one eye on them and, and answer them if, if needed. But I suppose the thing to say is um, I, I've got a really strong team um, in Manchester. Anybody who um, knows Manchester knows this is a, a really prestigious brand um, that's quite known. Um, we're the largest regional, we've got a bigger audience than some nationals and we've got a team of reporters at all stages of their career so people stay with us um but we also have quite a, a young um and diverse group um of, of uh trainee and more uh, senior reporters so you it's a great place to learn i mean i remember very vividly learning from my more senior colleagues some of who are still here today and what you'll get from the time with us is learning It'll be very practical, um, as Veronica said, very on the ground skills. You'll be out a lot um, doing jobs and talking to people. I think it's a really exciting environment. I've been doing this 25 years. I still find it exciting when I come in the newsroom. Um, so if that's the sort of life you like, unpredictable, exciting, um, this is probably um, the, the job for you, really. Um, in regional local journalism, we originate a lot of, co of content. So one of the things we'll probably teach you is, is kind of how to have ideas. I can't walk down the street or listen to radio or daydream without thinking of an idea of something. And I drive the news desk mad going, oh, should we do this or should we do that? Um, and I think that to some extent, as Veronica said, if you're curious, I thought it was a really well summarized um, set of skills for a journalist. You need to be really curious. And if you're curious, um, you have ideas, but sometimes you need to just be steered in how to have ideas. And that's a thing that I think you'll, you'll learn from us um, very much, very much so really. But there's basics like how to construct a story. Um, a lot of the best journalists have started. They start and they right at the beginning, they can't actually understand how to construct a story. So that's something you learn. Uh, we have quite a, a defined training scheme here. Um, how to build contacts at every level of journalism, relationships and contacts are the most important thing. Um, so we'll teach you that, um, how to ask questions, what to do when people say no, which they do say no, how to find the way around things, um, how, to, how to understand what a story is, which some people need to be shown as well. Um, so... Um, what sort of stuff will you do with us? Um, you'll do um, some live news. Live news is our, our bread and butter. You will go to police cordons. Maisie will tell you this. Um, and there are many and they are regular and people expect us to pr be providing the content from it. So you'll learn really hard news reporting like that. And some of that is quite difficult. Um, uh, but it's the bread and butter of what we do and it has brings huge audiences. Um, You'll also go to court. We've got some very experienced, two very, very experienced court reporters. That's a particular skill. All these skills are useful, whatever your type of journalism you go on. We'll also spend time with what's on. Anybody who's been through Manchester knows it's very vibrant and our food and drink scene is very vibrant. And um, the, But to write around that, you can't just send a news reporter. It's a really different sort of writing. And I, I think that one of the things that we have here is lots of different sorts of writing that you can learn because reviewing a restaurant or writing about something entertaining needs a very different style to, you know, covering a serious news event. We'll go to council meetings. Um, you may see some national politicians if they float by. We've got quite a bit of cabinet in Manchester now. So, you know, you might do stuff like that. Um, one thing that we do, which I think we do really well, um, is agenda setting reads. We've got, we had two um, campaigns that made it into the law and we're in the King's Speech this year. So we're quite a campaigning voice. Um, and we do, particularly around the weekend, 
reads um, and will have a different approach to them. So depending on how you progress, you'll learn a bit about long form writing um, and how, how you approach things like that differently, where you need to explore issues. But all that wouldn't come till after you've got the basics. So we just kind of see how you go. It's a warm and friendly team. Um, it, it's um, a can-do team. It's hard work, but it's but it's worth it. It's very rewarding. Um, I probably should have mentioned as well, We because... We want to be where the readers are. We've got quite a, we tell our stuff through lots of different platforms, not just the site, the paper, the app. Um, we've got presences on, strong presence on Instagram and TikTok. And um, we have a YouTube channel. So you've got a chance to understand how content is distributed and um, perhaps try hand up some video storytelling. We've got some really good video editors here as well. Um, we can support with shorthand lessons. I'm still a big believer in shorthand. I think it's a really good discipline uh, to allow you, whether or not you go to, you can't go to court and cover court without it, but it's not just about court, it's about being able to take down stuff really quickly. It's a good skill to have, a good discipline. Um, we've got a good, we have regular legal workshops here. We've got quite a good legal team. Um, and we work, we'll work with you on copy. We've got some very good content editors. We've got a big content editing team. And they're really good on sorting out copy because clean copy is quite um, a, an important basic that allows you to then go on and, and do different things. The point I made about having quite a, a big a big a spread of um, experience means that there are plenty of people to be reporter mentors and, and reach the company that I work for has a really good well-being um, uh, support network. Um, I sort of just wanted to end, obviously, to I'll take any questions on this, but... We're talking about what sort of person, just really, I, I completely, I was, I was really agreeing with everything in my head that Veronica said about um, being really interested in things, being interested in people um, is the most basic requirement for a journalist, um, being curious, understanding why things are happening and why things aren't happening and wanting to be almost obsessive in your pursuit of the whys and the where's not taking no for an answer. You don't have to be overconfident, cocky. I was quite a shy, younger person, and I would, the sort of 15, 17, 20 year old me would have been very surprised at where I am today. Um, and um, so don't adhere to any stereotypes. If you're interested in people, stories, why things happen. Um, and I think those are real basic requirements. You do have to work hard be persistent um, um, and I think have probably a good sense of humour. Um, there's a lot of hard work done here, but also quite a lot of laughing um, and an, a, a kind of an eye for the ridiculous, which we also enjoy a lot. I think probably that's it from me, unless there's anything further that you want, Laura. That's super. Um, thanks, Sarah. And great to hear that, um, that you have a great sense of humour in your in your team. <laughs> I think that's a lovely one. Um, Super. So now I'm going to pass to Macy and i um, quite excited to hear more about the different stories you've worked on, Macy. So if you could provide a couple of examples, that would be brilliant. Yeah. Do you want me to speak about the NCTJ as well? Yes, please. Yeah. OK, I'll start. I'll start there. I'll start at the beginning. So uh, Veronica actually called me and told me I got the job when I was in clinic. I was at the hospital uh, and I was waiting all morning for that call, shaking. I had colleagues texting me, ringing my boss saying, have you got it? Do we know? Come on, let's know. So that was a very, very important, very special day in my life. I even had a patient come up to me and shake my hand and say, well done. A lot of the doctors and the nurses, psychiatrists, everyone I worked with was very pleased. So yeah, getting that call is amazing. And then I, I knew, I think like three weeks later, it wasn't, it was just, let's go. There was no waiting time. And I was, I loved it. I was very ready to get going. Uh, and I started my NCCJ last year on the 3rd of September. So just a little over a year ago. And I didn't know what I was going to expect going into it. Like I said, I had no previous professional journalism experience. All I knew journalism was watching the news, reading the MEM and my granddad, that kind of aspect of it. So going in there was amazing. If you do get this apprenticeship, you'll study a range of different modules from incredible tutors who work in places such as Sky News, PA. So you're going to get the wide breadth. And we do cover everything in there from essential journalism, which is central writing skills, journalism for digital audience, where you look at communicating with your audience via social media, that kind of aspect. 
You'll also study media law, which is very, very important. And for myself, when I was at the MEN, came very much in handy when I went to court. Public affairs as well, which again, when I went to the MEN, very useful learning about councils and tax brackets and that sort of aspect. And you'll also do your shorthand. Shorthand is hard. Shorthand is very hard, but oh my gosh, what a useful skill. Um, I, I pursued it very, very heavily. I was determined to get my 100. Prior to me into the MEN, I failed my 100. And you have that moment of like, oh no, can I do this? But you know, dust yourself off, dust yourself off, go again. I went back to the MEN, was very grateful for them giving me support to continue learning shorthand through someone called Thomas Cock, who was very helpful. So yeah, I let I got the first half of my NCTJ at the end of last January. I believe I moved back to Manchester January 26th. I left there with some grades that I'm very proud of, including two A's in media law and public affairs as well as an investigation into uh, just a foil arrest through my JDA coursework. That was my first FOI request to Met Police. I got back off them. My tutors were, were very proud. I was very proud. So yeah, the NCTJ is going to be great. And hopefully, like myself, you do this job, you're going to make some great friends. The, the girls that I met on that course are like my sisters. We, we're going to live together in a couple of weeks. Uh, you know, it's going to, it, yeah, the NCTJ, just a great starting point. And then you are going to go to the MEN and, as Sarah was saying, the humour and the camaraderie there is incredible. If I had to describe the MN in one word, I would say mate, <laughs> because that you'll hear that word everywhere you go. You could walk in straight in the world, like, hey, mate, you all right? And what a bro, that kind of thing. It's just, oh, it's such a lovely room. And being able to learn from reports like Neil Keeling, George Lithgow, Ethan Davies, Nicola Wooten Kane, Tom George, I could just go on and on and on. They were all incredible, and I hold them in such high regard. And just the privilege of just sitting at a desk next to them, seeing what they did was incredible. And, you know, if you do this apprenticeship, working with them is amazing. Same in court, Amy Walker and Andrew Barsley, incredible. So, yeah, I went to the AMEN in February. I started off, as Sarah said, with the basics. I had the foundation. It was time to build. So, yeah, I started with press releases. My first byline was about Bolton train station getting new lifts. To some people, that might not seem like a lot or very important, but... My mum has always taught me, well, look at the wider picture. What are you doing right now that's helping somebody? And I thought back and I thought, okay, this information is letting someone know that there's lifts now so people in a wheelchair can access that station, young women with babies, maybe with buggies. It may not seem like this is a great thing about children. It may not seem important to the person writing it. It is, of course. But to someone else, you're giving them information that may change their day, their life. You never know. So every, every story is incredible. Every story is important. Um, and from there, I kept building. I kept getting amazing support from the team, from my editors, Amanda, Seamus, Todd, Ian, incredible. And yeah, I kept building myself up. And um, one of the big, one of my proud moments, I think it was in March, I went to my first live scene. It was a chemical gas leak. Whoa, which was just to me incredible. You know, most people spoke about their live scene, it was usually a car crash or a police incident. And here was I, a chemical gas leak on a Monday morning. And that was also my first experience with Facebook Live, which I came to really enjoy doing. With Facebook Live, you know, you could be in that scene for an hour and then get the call for saying, okay, the story's got an attraction now, we're going to go Facebook Live, five minutes, prepare a script, let's go. So again, like uh, Veronica and Sarah were saying, think on your feet, you've got to be quick. But after you come off that Facebook Live, telling everyone that information and letting them know the story, it's an incredible feeling. And I always really love doing Facebook Lives and live scenes. Um, another story that I'm very, very proud of, well, the whole team did amazing on it. I just began it off with Kenny Brown of Photographers, was the discovery of Stuart Everett's torso in Kersal Wetlands. That morning, nobody knew what it was. All we knew was a blue police tent was up. I was already out in Moss Side at a fatal stabbing of a young man called Prince. So I got sent there. And then me and Kenny were there in the morning watching the police come. We knew it was going to be a big deal. That was kind of evident from the amount of police presence. But then we got the confirmation from the police. Todd Fitzgerald, one of the editors, told me, mate, OK, it's a human torso. Get it on Twitter. Let's let everyone know. So that was the start of a very, very big story that was actually picked up. I quite a lot of nationals that day as well. I think GB News came down to the LBC, potentially. So that was another one that I'm very, very proud of. Um, as well, speaking back to print... One that really speaks to me is one I did about a young mum who was currently staying in emergency accommodation at a place called Fallowfield Lodge. It was a horrible, horrible place. It had maggots and rats. You know, her children weren't safe, nor was she, and she just wanted to get out. And, you know, having the trust, having her trust me to tell that story and to put it out there, especially because I'm from Manchester and my family not from a very 
part of my that's very well off. So, you know, telling these stories of these people who do need help is what's made regional journalism so special, I find, is like Sarah was saying, you are in the community, you know, you are within it, you are with them. And they're putting a lot of trust in you to share their story and, you know, get everything out there that they want to know. Uh, also, again, going again, court, court in Manchester is uh, very colourful, put it that way. You're going to see a lot of different uh, characters and you're also going to see some things that are very hard hitting. I think going in, that should be very clear. But as long as you're willing to enter with an open mind and the ability to, at the end of the day, talk about it and, you know, not hold it in you'll be okay. Uh, I remember my first court case was a young man that I went to at Andrew Barsley, a 17 year old boy called Callum Riley. He was stabbed in the Darnhill estate by a local drug dealer over a drug feud. And what stuck me the most was I then went to the um, sentencing a couple months later of the four co-conspirators who were found guilty, hearing Callum's mum's witness statement from his girlfriend's mum saying, I should be decorating an 18 function hall for my son. And second, I'm decorating his gravesite. So you're going to also get that. You're going to get a lot of things that are going to be heavily impacting. And yeah, you're going to hit a wall. I hit a wall. I got very down. But you've got to have that resilience to get up and go again. You know, that's what's so important about journalism and regional journalism. You're going to see some things that are hard, but you've got to keep going. Resilience is key. Having a thick skin is key. Letting no's or people say no to box pops or being in the midst of a lot of maybe like a bad situation, a bad cordon. Keep going. But yeah, it's um, resilience, thick skin, and you're also going to get so much compassion from it. So yeah, it's going to be great. And I really hope if you get this apprenticeship, you enjoy it. Incredible. Thanks, Macy. Um, and we're going to move to um, some questions from the audience now. Um, so if you have any questions, um, please do pop them in the Q&A function. Um, you just select the Q&A box on, on your Zoom screen. Um, and I'm going to stop sharing my slides um, for the second. Um, so that we can see everyone more clearly. Bear with me a second for that. I'm nervous to press end because I'm not sure if that's end the webinar or end the slide sharing. So I'm going to leave it up for a second um, just in case that's the wrong button. Um, but we've got some questions to um, put together um, to the panel. And I'm going to kick off um, perhaps if everyone could do uh, a bit of a, a, a top line on what um, kind of, well, we've kind of covered what a successful application makes, but um, I think it would be good to know a bit more about the workload um, and how hands on the apprenticeship would be. I don't know who wants to take that question. I guess what would the average day look like for an apprenticeship? Um, Macy, do you want to give an example, maybe, and then Veronica um, or Sarah kind of talk more broadly about what a, an apprenticeship can expect? Yeah, so um, in the regional newsroom, a day could look like we have different shift patterns, uh, 8 4 10 6 years, 12 8 and three eleven. I think, were the typical ones that you could work. So depending on what shift pattern you want, it kind of depends on what you're going to do that day. Um, but yeah, you come in in the morning, say hello to everyone. I always start by checking my email in case I had anything left over from yesterday, any new PRs that were coming in that were quite interesting. Or if I had some off one of my editors, that maybe what to look into, that kind of aspect. So I always started with that. Um, and then I always check social media. Facebook groups are a really great place to find news, so is X. So I always just check them for stories. After that, I then move on to the story of the day that I was working on, maybe from beforehand or that I've been given today. And that could involve maybe phoning someone up for an interview, emailing council press offices, doing some deep dives on social media or the internet. And then there's always the possibility of going out to a live scene. That could happen at any point in the shift. So always be ready for that. And then, yeah, that's a really typical day. You know, you come in, you do your briefs, chat to everyone, see what everyone else is doing, get your work and get going, and then potentially go to a live scene at some point in the day. Super. Um, Sarah and Veronica, do you want to kind of speak kind of maybe about the different aspects that Manchester Evening News or fin um, Financial Times? I think it's probably quite different. I'll just kick off. I mean, unpredictable, I think, is, is, uh, is a day. Um, and 
you know, we make one plan and then that goes because another thing happens. So because we're quite live news um, focused, I think expecting the unexpected, being prepared to, you know, if you saw a person that likes everything laid out perfectly before you and it not to change, then it probably isn't the right option for this kind of journalism. Now, there are different kinds of journalism that are more organised. Um, so, and I think the exposure to different skills is a really critical thing as well, because, um, you know, you, you say you might be sent to court and it might depend who's in the office who will offer different help and support. And there will be um, focus with, uh, you have a line manager, it was Amanda in, in Maisie's case, who will look after you, well-being, pastoral care, but also your data, to make, ensure you spend time with different departments. So some of that will be structured, but generally it might be quite unpredictable, I think is probably a fair summary. I think Maisie might agree with that. Uh, don't make plans. Um, kind of a bit like that, but I suspect it might be different at the FT. Hiya. Yeah. Um, yeah, so um, what's a typical day look like? Um, as a journalist at the FT, uh, you don't have typical days. And I would say that if you are the type of person that likes the idea of a typical day, then probably journalism at the Financial Times isn't for you. Um, and I would um, be so bold as, say, as to say the same goes for the Manchester Evening News. Um, journalism isn't about sort of typical days and schedules. It's about reacting to events and um, they're unpredictable by their nature. Um, workload, um, it's heavy. It's really heavy. Um, and if you are in the role and you're finding that it doesn't feel heavy, then probably you are not working to your full potential or to our expectation. Um, Journalism is a funny thing. It's not a list of sort of given tasks. Um, it's based a lot on your own initiative. So you really should be keeping yourself busy in the role. Um, and if you find, like I say, that you have um, a lot of spare time on your hands or you're sort of sitting around feeling unpressured, then probably you're not asking enough of yourself. And probably you're not on the route to success within the Financial Times newsroom. And again, I'd probably be as bold as to say, or within the Manchester Evening News. You know, it's a lot about you asking questions again and again and again. It's absolutely about persistence. Um, as Sarah um, talked about earlier, it's about not giving up. There's the, the why should never end for you. You know, and every answer should probably lead you on to another why. Um, and if that's not the case, then probably you're better suited to a role outside of frontline journalism. You know, it might be that analysis is more your thing. It might be that sort of story editing. So editing other people's work might be more your thing because, you know, you may well have an interest in current affairs and the topics that we cover and use of the English language and communicating stories, but it might be that you're better suited to an editing role than a reporting role. And the newsroom apprenticeship is very much geared to reporting, um, which might not have been made, um, actually I might not have made that as clear at the top as I should have done. It's very much geared to reporting and not to other newsroom roles. You'll get a flavor of other newsroom roles, but the training that we're providing is very much around reporting. And reporting is a job that's unpredictable, um, doesn't really have a schedule and kind of relies on you being very self-motivating. Thank you. That's crystal clear. And we've got some kind of questions in the chat around the proportion of time you spend on different things and like how work comes in. Is it um, do you get to choose what topics you write about or are they assigned? And then what's the kind of split between being in the newsroom and being out in the field? And I guess also for the apprenticeship, also the proportion of time spent on study. I don't know who could speak to that, please. Um, I think probably Maisie could probably speak to more to the sort of balancing the study and being enrolled. Um, I would say that the Financial Times is quite unusual in 
we're what we call a reporter led organization. So at some in some newsrooms, you have editors that tell the reporters um, what needs to be covered and they'll assign the work and reporters will go out and cover it. Because the Financial Times newsroom, um, we have reporters that are specialists in their areas. So we'll have like a banking reporter who specializes in reporting on banks. Um, we'll have somebody that is our, um, I don't know, our West Africa bureau chief that specializes in West Africa. Um, so the way we work with our network is we expect the reporters to be bringing the stories to us. So um, reporters pitch stories to their um, relevant desks um, and then the desk will tell them whether or not it's something that they feel would be appropriate for them to run on any given day. And it very much, it's a dialogue. So again, it comes back to persistence. Desk editors are busy and they have many, many people phoning in and emailing in with many, many ideas. And sometimes you'll get a reflexive no. Um, but the best reporters, won't stop there they'll come back they'll ask why it doesn't quite work they'll try to reframe it and if they don't get anywhere with one desk the most entrepreneurial reporters will move to another desk where they think they might be able to um, re-engineer the story so it fits better so you might have a question I don't you might have a story I don't know about the shortage of um, a particular good in a, in a in the country that you're the the report at the correspondent for okay um and you might pitch it to the world desk which is your usual desk and they might say mm, sounds fun but it's not it's not going to make it for today um and you may go back and say you know it's actually causing real social unrest and or there might be like a real economics angle to this it might seem like a small story but actually this is really important for my patch and actually it's something that people in other areas of the world might be able to relate to and the world editor might say, yeah, I'm sorry, but, you know, we have active conflict here and we have presidential debates there. And this is just going to feel a little bit sort of parochial. Um, the most entrepreneurial reporter will take all of that on board, put the phone down and pick it straight back up and get onto the company's desk and ask them if they're aware that a particular manufacturer is having problems getting their goods to where they are in the world. And they'll re-angle it from a business and logistics point of view and try to look for the the sort of ramifications to the business world. Um, and if that editor says no, they may then think about writing what we call a notebook, which is a sort of um, 300 word or so piece that you can um, submit from a place in the world that gives you a flavour of that place or highlight something um, about that place, which is um, possibly a very small thing, but that actually tells a bigger story about the place. So they might then get, and that's run by the opinion desk. And so, you know, having, having had to end conversations with the world desk and the company's desk, they may then go straight to the opinion desk and offer it as a notebook. So, it's very much about motivating yourself, believing in yourself, advocating for yourself and your stories. Um, and so, as I said, if you're finding that you don't have much to do, it's probably because you're not working hard enough, really. But um, I think that the situation is quite different at the Manchester Evening News, so um, Sarah can probably explain to how it works there. Yeah, so we have one desk it's like an uber desk and we're um a desk controlled operation mm -hmm. but we have specialists within it so we have an nhs specialist and a crime and a, you know transport and whatever we have that mm -hmm. the way it works is that um so ideas can come from anywhere and i have an i have quite an open conference where ideas can come from anywhere but the, on a generally on a daily basis particularly coming in as a trainee you'll be sent out and you'll be told um, where to go and what to do. But the best trainees and actually the best reporters, whenever the desk wanders over and says, right, what have you got on your list? I might be sending you out. If what's on their list is better than what the desk has got, then yeah. the desk is always going to pick what's on the list, aren't they? And, um, and I, you know, I remember being a reporter and I was, you know, 
absolutely obsessed with investigative reporting. I would make sure, I'd pride myself on having something better than the desk was going to give me. And if they do, you got left alone. Um, the live news reporters will be out more often because there's no choice. We do need to go on those. Um, particularly with the movement that we've had in the last sort of five years, which is around generating a lot more, um, as I say, long form pieces about the environment we live in, the history of the area, some of the social problems that there are around here, the inequalities that we find. We um, have a kind of separate, almost a features operation, but it's not features in the old fashioned word of it, it's reads really. And ideas from that come from anywhere. Um, they can come from the desk, they can come off of spin offs from main stories. And then there's quite a firm editing process and headline process around them. We tend to say to reporters if they have an idea, what do you think the headline would be on that? Because we were obviously a very different model. We're not a subscription model. So we have to stand out and it was a very crowded market. Mm. That really hones your skills because um, you can have the best story in the world in the environment that we're playing in. And unless you put an eye-catching headline, and by that I don't mean a clickbait headline, I mean an eye-catching headline that might be um, just interesting and make you want to read on. Um, and, and, you know, we do that with court now. You'll never know that it's a court report from the headline or from the storytelling you, because actually court isn't a court report. A court report is about people. So we'll look at we'll look at that with headlines. So a lot of the time, if somebody has an idea, we'll go, well, well, what's your headline? And we'll work with them. And that's part of the training, really. I mean, Maisie will have seen, Maisie, you'll have seen Chris put headlines on stories that are quite simply remarkable and they make them fly. So, um, but the desk is kind of, I, I, I know from talking to colleagues, it's quite different from the FT. A lot of the, the power and the running of the day comes from there by necessity. But that doesn't mean that there isn't a, a quite a collaborative environment because in my opinion, the more brains we have on this, the more ideas we have, the more likelihood we are to be telling the stories that matter. I, I, there was another question, wasn't there, about proportion? And it's really hard to answer that proportion you'd be sent out. Um, okay. It depends on the day. And it, it sometimes, you know, you can go to, as Maisie described brilliantly, on one thing in, in, in the morning and different in the afternoon. She does make it sound like Manchester's bloodbath. I promise you it isn't. There's a lot of <laughs> things that happen and great entrepreneurs. It's a great city. <laughs> but yeah, yeah, it I'm is. Proud it, to be from it there. Is. It's just a big city with big city challenges. All right, I think we're going to close now with our final question. So it's kind of a question pitched a little bit more broadly, um, but essentially what would be your top tip? Just one tip, if you had to pick one, to either your younger self or a prospective applicant looking for a career in journalism, just starting out. What would you like to, that kind of guidance or advice to pass on? Who would like to go first? I'm not happy to Oh, no, you go first, Macy. Uh, for myself, I, I say read. Read widely, read broadly, read opinions you don't agree with, opinions that you do. Uh, read from authors and from journalists from all essence of backgrounds. You, ca you can't enter this profession, I, I think, from what I've learned, having just one set idea of what you want to do and who you want to be and what, what you want to write. That's not how it works. You've got to be open to learning from people from all over even people you don't agree with because that's how you grow as a journalist and as a person and i think that was that's for me right now it's very very key in my regression right now even now i'm going to the investors chronicle soon i'm not the best at maths or coming to markets but that doesn't mean i'm gonna i'm gonna panic i'm gonna keep learning i'm gonna keep reading and i'm gonna keep going because i want to be the best that i can be you get out what you put in so for me read and just keep working hard she wants to take it next oh i think i'm already off mute so um i'll just go and say um i'd probably say um don't be afraid of what you don't know um i think um early in my career i was hyper aware of my knowledge deficits <laughs> and so that often made me shy away from um opportunities um and it's quite ironic because i very much moved out of my comfort zone but every time I was shoved so I was shoved into the world of business news um, and shoved into um, looking at economics and economics analysis it's 
not it wasn't my background from university at all but it happened to be that when I graduated that's where the opportunities were and if I really wanted to be a journalist that's what was on offer to me at the time that was what um, I was able that was a way into journalism for me and um, I'm so glad that I took that route because it's given me opportunities that I I'm uh, too 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 many for me to list here um, but I'm uh, my my much younger self coming out of university would be absolutely flabbergasted by the things my jobs allowed me to do and the places that it's taken me to. Thanks, Veronica. And over to you, Sarah. I agree with both Veronica and Maisie's points. I think if I was talking to the younger me, I'd say, don't worry so much. Um, you know, stop worrying about, it's a bit like Veronica says, the things that you think you can't do. And actually... <laughs> Uh, try, try and see and fail. And actually, it's okay to fail at certain things. I've learned many yeah. of my best, best learnings are from the things I've copped up. If I'm honest, uh, particularly when I was I was younger, I think follow the little voice. Uh, my little voice, which is that thing inside, has, has stayed pretty true throughout my whole um, career. And find a good mentor. I had a mentor, at least Roland, who was actually, you know, it was quite a male dominated environment that I went into. But there was a female news editor. Um, amid a sea of kind of um, kind of very elderly white men in in the MEN newsroom, so I was a very young pup, and I think there were two other women. That's it, and it was quite a very big newsroom. And um, but Lisa was incredible, and we hit it off straight away. And I even now, and we're good mates outside work now. She's retired now. Even now, I think to myself, what would Lisa do? And there are things I do instinctively. So I think you find those people, don't you, in your life? And and I've had a few, but she stands out. And they become like, um, you learn how they handle them. You might go in a different direction. You might not do things exactly. You take the best bits from everybody and you learn. Um, and I think I wouldn't be here in this role without the influence that she and several others had on me. Um, and just one extra point, just what Maisie said about read left, read right. Um, even if you're a liberal lefty in your politics, it is really important to read everything and challenge yourself. The worst thing you can be is in a, a kind of little box of people with your own opinions. And even if you think, well, I, I don't, I'm not going to be do opinion, I'm not going to do analysis. You read it because it's great for your brain and it, it exposes you to the world. Um, and you can't write about things authoritatively if you haven't considered the other side of the situation. So I think that would be it from me. Well, some incredible top tips there. Thank you. And I think we're going to, we've run over a little bit. So I'm going to kind of wrap up now. Um, I'm going to first share um, our feedback form um, with everyone. So bear with me as I just flick through to the right one. Here we go. If you're watching today, thanks for hanging on in there and seeing us right through to the end. And please do let us know your feedback and doing these things. Um, you know, it's always helpful to know what we're doing right, what we're doing wrong and how we could improve for next time. So um, you can just um, click on um, the link in the chat or take the QR code um, on screen. Um, otherwise, I also wanted to use this opportunity just to say, um, thank you um, to all of our panellists for your time and for your advice, for your guidance, for your insights, for going into the detail. It's so much appreciated. We're going to post a recording of this webinar on the advert page so you can review it in your own time if you are planning to put in an application. Um, additionally, um, thanks to the audience for being wonderful guests and thanks to the team behind the scenes to making this happen. Um, it's very much appreciated. Um, and just to our panellists, is there anything else you wanted to say just before we, we make we make a wrap? Uh, just one more from me. When you're applying, don't doubt yourself, okay? It's easy to compare what others might be writing. Your experience is unique and it matters. And I know from when having speaking to Veronica and Shari and Amanda on my initial call, when they recalled my cover letter and my own experiences, that was great. So yeah, don't doubt yourself and just don't be don't be scared to speak about your life and who you are. We want to know. We want your opinion in the newsroom and your voice. It matters. So yeah, don't doubt yourself. Cool. Some brilliant advice just in the last few minutes. And thanks everyone. Get in your application by next Thursday, the 19th, and we look here forward to hearing from you. Thanks again to all the panellists for your time. Take care. Bye-bye.